Darwin's Doubt, Part 2. Um, we've been looking at the book uh, Darwin's Doubt, written by Stephen Meyer, PhD. He's author of Signature in the Cell, which we went through not that long ago. Um, he was originally an oil industry geophysicist, got his master's degree in that, and then uh, got a PhD from Cambridge in the philosophy of science when he became interested in, among other things, the origin of life, which of course has led to his book Signature in the Cell. Uh, he is currently the director for the Center for Science and Culture at the Discovery Institute. Um, and this is a matter of personal interest. I just met him this last Sabbath when he, had, uh, when he was there at the um, showing of the film of Flight. Um, and um, he's had a chance to look at uh, last week's um, um, talk and liked it, so for what it's worth. Um, this book is, in fact, a massive expansion of Meyer's article, The Origin of Biological Information and the Higher Taxonomic Categories in the Proceedings of the Biological Society of Washington, a work which was um, uh, retracted in spite of no real reason for it and uh, the editor was then attempted at being purged and finally found uh, employment elsewhere. Um, that's what the cover looks like, and you'll notice that I have taken the uh, background from the slide from the cover. Uh, in the prologue, he noted that the book is divided into three main parts, and um, part one is the mystery of the missing fossils, which we are in. Part two, how to build an animal. Um, and then finally, part three, after Darwin, what? And so we're into part one now. It looks like it will take us at least uh, three um, discussion periods to go through part one. Uh, chapter one, just as a one slide summary, the, and you'll notice that when I do something where I don't take directly off of what he has to say. I'll put it in light green instead of white. The sudden appearance of multiple life forms in the Cambrian was a major unsolved problem for Darwin and some of Darwin's contemporaries, most notably Lee Agassi, cited this reason in rejecting Darwin's theory. And. Um, as a side note, we noticed that uh, Richard Dawkins implied that the problem is still unsolved, although he's quite sure that there has to be a solution. Um, because after all, evolution is true, that means that there has to be a solution. Um, today we're going to talk about the discovery of the Burgess Shale, um, and we'll get into um, uh, the uh, story as it is sometimes told among paleontologists, the fateful clue that led to the Burgess Shale's discovery is the stuff of legend. Paleontologist Stephen Jay Gould considered it to have been rendered best in an obituary of Charles Walcott, written by Walcott's former research assistant, Charles Schuchert. One of the most striking of Walcott's final discoveries came at the end of the field se season of 1909 when Mrs. Walcott's horse slid on going down the trail and turned up a slab that at once attracted her husband's attention. Here was a great treasure, wholly strange crustacea of middle Cambrian time, but where in the mountain was the mother rock from which the slab had come? Snow was even then falling, and the solving of the riddle had to be left for another season. But uh, uh, next year, the Walcotts were back again on Mount Wapta, and eventually the slab was traced to a layer of shale, later called the Burgess Shale, 3,000 feet above the town of Field. Gould quotes the legend to celebrate its archetypal appeal, even as he debunks it. Consider the primal character of this tale, the lucky break provided by the slipping horse, the greatest discovery at the very last minute of a field season with falling snow and darkness heightening the drama of finality. 
The anxious wait through a winter of discontent, the triumphant return and careful methodological tracing, uh, methodical tracing of errant block to mother load. <coughs> a compelling story, Gold concludes, but pure fiction. Walcott's own diaries revealed that his team had plenty of time to begin ex excavating the site that very summer amidst cooperative weather and even warm nights. As for their return the following summer, locating the mother load was apparently the work of a single day rather than a full week. A conclusion Gould drew from both Walcott's diaries and his knowledge of Walcott's expertise as a geologist. So it wasn't quite as dramatic as they make it out to be, but the motifs of the lucky break, the frustrating delay, and the final and fortuitous triumph will resurface later sees chapter seven as its tall tale of Gould's own. And we'll be looking forward to seeing that. But for now, consider only the scientific community's weakness for staging the Burgess discovery with va various fictional props, as if the stunning scenery around it were not setting enough. This weakness for theater is understandable considering what Walcott and later investigators found there. Over the next several years, Walcott's team alone collected more than 65,000 specimens, many of them astonishingly well-preserved, some so bizarre that paleontologists would cast about for more than half a century for the proper categories in which to contain them. This um, is one of the critters that was there. On the right is the uh, actual fossil, and on the left is a reconstruction based on um, several uh, different fossils. <laughs> what is that creature? Well, Nothing that we really know well. Um, here's another one. Appropriately named Hallucigenia sparsa. We, we've never seen anything like this. I don't even think in the deep sea bottom. Uh, in fact, for a while when they were reconstructing, they, they couldn't decide which side was up. And maybe they have it wrong now. The term Cambrian explosion was to become common coin because Walcott's site suggested that geologically abrupt appearance of a menagerie of animals as various as any found in the gaudiest science fiction. During this explosion of fauna, representatives of about 20 of the roughly 26 in the total phyla present in the known fossil record made their first appearance on Earth. See figure 2.5, and we're going to see that figure in a minute. And that note 5 I'm going to come back to at the end. The term phyla, singular phylum, refers to divisions in the biological classification system. The phyla constitute the highest or widest categories of biological classification in the animal kingdom, with each exhibiting a unique architecture, organizational blueprint, or structural body plan. Familiar examples of phyla are cnidarians, corals, and jellyfish, mollusks, squid and clams, echinoderms, that's sea stars and sea urchins, and starfish, uh, arthropods, trilobites, insects, spiders, and the chordates, to which all vertebrates, including humans, belong. Throughout the book, I will use these conventional categories of classification, as do most Cambrian paleontologists. Nevertheless, I'm aware that in some paleontologists and systematists, um, experts in classification, today prefer phylogenetic classification, a method that often uses a rank-free rank classification scheme. Now, he'll go on to say that they're trying to classify them instead of and how different they are at present by 
their sharing of a common ancestor. So it's really an attempt to use evolution as a major part of your classification scheme. This method of classification treats groups that emerge at roughly the same time on the tree of life as equivalent. And that's just, of course, assuming you have a tree of life. Um, and nevertheless, even proponents of phylogenetic classification often use the conventional taxonomic categories in their technical discussions of specific organisms because of their common scientific usage. Everybody knows what um, phylum is pretty much, at least has it's commonly used, and so it's useful in a discussion if you, if you don't believe in the underlying classification. So despite my own sympathy with some of the concerns of rank fee advocates, see below, I've chosen to do the same. This is, of course, Stephen Meyer speaking. And here is the, um, you'll notice that the running total is here, and it's 36 at the end, and there are 20 Cambrian phyla, and here you can see the list of them, um, which dwarfs everything else. In any case, it's worth noting that using a rank-free rank -free classification system does not minimize the mystery of the Cambrian explosion. The Cambrian explosion presents a puzzle for evolutionary biologists not just because of the number of phyla that arise, but rather because of the number of unique animal forms and structures that arise. In other words, it doesn't really matter how you, what you call them. The thing is, they look very much distinct from each other extremely distinct from each other. Um, dogs and uh, coyotes are, for example, much, much closer. Even dogs and cats are much closer than, let's say, trilobites and hallucinogenia. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't matter how you do it. And uh, he has a nice technical end note. There are people who accuse him of not understanding this, and of course, that's baloney. He does have a nice section in the text and a nice note that explains his take on the whole thing. It's amazing how people who read him just simply brush by those kinds of things and miss them, um, at least if they're not reading him for comprehension, but rather to refute him. And here's another... Uh, drawing, and here you can see various phyla that originated during the Cambrian explosion. The variety in the Burgess Shale was so extreme, it took several decades for paleontologists to grasp it fully. Walcott, for, for instance, attempted to fit all of the new forms into existing phyla. However, even in the midst of this attempt, he realized that this revolutionary quarry posed a problem more fundamental than a need to tidy up existing taxonomy. He had met Louis Agassiz at a young age, having sold him some of his first fossils, and later described him as, quote, a guide in, in whom I could trust and follow, one in whose work, quote, I find this tribute to the great mind that created the objects of his study. But in the great debate between Agassiz and Darwin, Walcott sided with the Englishman. Thus, the Burgess Shale struck Walcott as not only fascinating, but puzzling. Where are all the ancestors? Over the years, as paleontologists have reflected on the overall pattern of the Precambrian Cambrian fossil record in light of Walcott's discoveries, they too have noted several features of the Cambrian explosion that are unexpected from a Darwinian point of view. Um, that should be a note. I missed that. Um, in particular, one, the sudden appearance of Cambrian animal forms. Two, an absence of transitional and intermediate forms connecting the Cambrian animals to simpler Precambrian forms. Three, a startling array of completely novel animal forms with novel body plans. And four, a pattern in which the radical difference in form in the fossil record arise before more minor small scale diversification and variation. Cats and dogs come after the whole categories of vertebrates and, um, mm -hmm. uh, say, arthropods, insects, trilobites, etc. cetera. 
This pattern turns on its head the Darwinian expectations of small incremental change only gradually resulting in larger and larger differences in form. Uh, figure 27 and 28 il illustrate the difficulty posed by the first of these two features, sudden appearance and missing intermediates. These diagrams graph morphological change over time. The first shows the Darwinian expectation that changes in morphology should arise only as tiny changes accumulate. This Darwinian commitment to gradual changes through microevolutionary variations produces the classic representation of evolutionary history as a branching tree. And there's the figure, at least the top part of it. This is the Darwinian theory that you'd have various branches, some of which die out, but some of which continue to the present. And what you actually see, and it's pretty linear too. You don't see a lot of branching, and you don't see, and you see them all coming up, or many of them coming up at the uh, Cambrian. Now compare this branching tree record with the pattern in the fossil record, the bottom part of figure 2.7, which we've just seen, and figure 2.8, which we will see shortly show that the Precambrian strata do not document the expected transmissional intermediates between Cambrian and Precambrian fauna. Instead, the Precambrian Cambrian fossil record, especially in the light of Burgess Shale after Walcott, points to the geologically sudden appearance of complex and novel body plans. And so what you actually have, and this is a simplified diagram, by the way. Remember there are 20 of these phyla. Um, You'll notice that all of, the, all of these dots are circled and not hard, like this one is. This is the sponges. But you'll notice also that the sponges don't come in from the side. They come straight in. That is to say, the Precambrian sponges, such as they are, there are not very many of them, look like our regular sponges. Um, and uh, presumably everything else branched off. Uh, we're talking, um, no, we're not talking mammals. Uh, we are, mammals are part of the phylum vertebrata. <coughs> mammals, birds, reptiles, amphibians, fish. So how far mm. back down do they go? Well, the fish go all the way to the Cambrian. In fact, we're going to see some of them. <coughs> the, other ma the other vertebrates come later. Partly because almost all of the other vertebrates need oxygen. Uh, need air oxygen. Um, Salamanders, for example, don't do too well in a totally, uh, in, in a EC environment. They do much better. They can live in, in rivers and stuff like that. Some of them have gills, but they need uh, more oxygen in the water than the typical fish does. Um, and here's the, uh, another one of those critters. Uh, you notice it has five eyes. You notice that it has this big proboscis with a um, some kind of grabber on the top of it. And um, what does it belong to? It's obviously bilaterian, but it's hard to say what else. Darwin, as we know, ex regarded the sudden appearance of the Cambrian animals as a significant challenge to his theory where natural selection had to bridge yawning chasms from relatively simple life forms to exquisitely complex creatures, it would require great expanses of time. Um, now, Darwin's recognition of this constraint was prescient, and um, Steve Meyer goes on to note that they didn't have radiometric methods and they didn't have DNA to help them out, but he somehow sensed uh, Dar nevertheless, Darwin was able, based on what he knew of the complexity of organisms and his own understanding of how the mechanisms of nat natural selection must operate, to deduce that descent with modification required time and lots of it. So there must be creatures before these. 
that were half trilobites or three quarters trilobites or something like that. Recalling the context of Darwin's original argument reveals why. In the origin, he sought to counter the famous watch to watchmaker design argument offered by theologian William Paley. Paley had argued that just as complex structures such as watches necessarily issued from intelligent watchmakers, the complex structures in living organisms must likewise owe their origin to designing intelligence. With natural selection, Darwin proposed a purely natural mechanism for constructing the complex organs and structures, such as eyes, present in many, life, many forms of life, and by the way, including in trilobites. His mechanism of natural selection worked by constructing such systems one tiny step at a time, each step being a little more useful than the other one, than the one before it. Discarding the harmful variations and seizing upon the rare improvements. If evolution progressed by whole watches, so to speak, that is by entire anatomical systems like the trilobite's eye, then biology would have fallen back to the old absurdity of imagining that a watch could fall together purely by random chance all at once. Thus, unless uh, D Darwin's evolutionary mechanism worked gradually by preserving the tiniest of random changes over many millions of years, it didn't work at all. And uh, this is Reader's Digest version. I'm not going to read you the whole thing. Obviously, it would take too long. First, the great profusion of completely novel forms of life in the Burgess Assemblages, feature three, demanded even more transitional forms than had previously been thought missing. You've got more animals, you've got to have more transitional forms. Each new and exotic Cambrian creature, the Anomalocarids, see figure 2.10, Morella, Opabinia, and the bizarre and appropriately named Hallucinogenia, for which there were again no obvious ancestral forms in the lower strata, required its own series of transitional ancestors. But where were they? And there's uh, Anomalocaris, which means anomalous or strange shrimp. Kind of a bizarre looking creature. Darwin had hoped that later fossil discoveries would eventually eliminate what he regard, regarded as the one outstanding anomaly associated with his theory, you may remember from last week. Walcott's discovery was not that discovery. Not only did the Burgess Shale fail to reveal the expected ancestral precursors of the known Cambrian animal forms, but it revealed a motley crew of previously unknown animal forms and body plans that now demanded their own lengthy chain of evolutionary precursors only complicating the task of explaining the Cambrian explosion in Darwinian terms. Um, again, if I have make comments, they'll be in green, although the words disparity and diversity are in the part that I'm talking about. And he goes on to say, the actual pattern in the fossil record, however, contradicts this expectation of Darwinism, diversity before disparity. That is, you should have different kinds of animals that are fairly closely related and then <coughs> less closely related and so forth. Whereas what you see is starting from way outside. And we'll see figure 212 and 211 in just a minute. Instead of more and more species eventually leading to more genera, leading to more families, orders, and classes, and phyla, the fossil record shows representatives of separate phyla appearing first, followed by lower level diversification on those basic themes. <coughs> I'll throw in something that he didn't, and that is that the trilobites, when they get a new kind of trilobite, you don't have gradually changing to that kind of trilobite. It also starts brand new. It's very interesting. And figure 211 is Darwin's own drawing. The only illustration I think he had in The Origin of Species. Um, but this is the kind of thing you'd expect. You'd expect one species, and then you'd expect several species in one genus. Then you'd expect several genera in one family. And then you'd expect several families in one phylum and so forth. That's or one class, I guess, actually, and then order and then phylum. <coughs> it's order, class, phylum, is it? I forget. Order, class, phylum, yeah. Yeah, order, class, phylum. Um, 
And um, this is what you actually see, which is the phylum comes first, and then there are different classes that come. There'll be one class and then several other ones, and then um, uh, a whole bunch of genera that are from the same classes. That's disparity mm -hmm. precedes diversity. Indeed, Walcott's discovery turned Darwin's anticipated bottom up, or small changes first, big changes later, pattern mm -hmm. on its head. But there's still the question of why so many different types of marine invertebrates, including soft-bodied ones, were so unusually well-preserved. Paleontologists think they know the answer. They think the marine animals that were later fossilized in the Burgess Shale lived near the bottom of an ancient sea in front of an underwater cliff or escarpment. Due to tectonic activity, blocks at the edge of this underwater cliff began to break off. These blocks slumped, creating underwater mud flows in their wake. These slumps and flows transported the Burgess animals several kilometers into deeper waters where they were buried in such a way as to leave them not only undamaged, but also protected from scavengers and bacteria. Uh, this actually sounds like a fairly likely scenario. I wonder what kind of uh, disturbance might have got that whole ball of wax rolling. Very probably, the mud flows were highly turbulent, for paleontologists found the creatures dumped and preserved in a variety of angles in relation to the bedding. The speed and pressure of these mud flows quickly produced a preservation-friendly, oxygen-free environment. Then the turbulent and muddy currents pressed fine silt and clay into the crevices of the bodies at just the right consistency and pressure to fossilize them without tearing the delicate appendages. An ideal set of circumstances for ensuring later observation by future paleontologists. I might make an observation that near the uh, near Death Valley, there's uh, an area where the uh, transport was not quite so gentle. And what you get is um, commonly called trilobite hash, which uh, basically broken pieces of trilobite are all mm -hmm. over the place and uh, in fairly high concentrations. So the nice thing about the Burgess is that somehow is able to preserve these things in, in block. Walcott grasped these difficulties and had a deep enough professional commitment to Darwinism to search for a solution. An idea occurred to Walcott that gave him fresh hope. According to Walcott, ancestral precursors to the trilobites and other distinctive Cambrian forms had existed, but they were not fossilized in sediments that would later be elevated above the sea level until early in the Cambrian. Instead, before the Cambrian, during a period when sea levels were lower, Trilobites and their ancestral forms were de being deposited offshore in what are now only deep sea sediments. That is, they're out in the Pacific Ocean somewhere. Walcott named this cryptic period of time in which trilobites and their animals were rapidly evolving offshore as the Lipalian interval. The term Lipalian is derived from the Greek word for lost. In this view, the ab abrupt appearance of the Cambrian body plans in the geologic column was merely an artifact of incomplete sampling of the fossil record and indeed the ability, inability to access the undersea sedimentary layers where the ancestors of the Cambrian fauna presumably lay encased. In short, the transgression and regression of ancient seas made the ancestral precursors of the Cambrian fauna inaccessible to discovery. In other words, they were there, but not uh, available. On his return to the Smithsonian, he placed, this is a Walcott, placed all of the exotic forms of the Burgess into modern phyla. One of his efforts at lumping placed Morella splendens, not only in the same phylum, but also in the same class, trilobita, as the trilobites. Despite obvious morphological differences, he justified this classification by arguing that the organism foreshadowed the trilobite. Uh, Gould later criticized Walcott's method of classification as shoehorning, uh, forcing it in. Walcott's theoretical accomplishment was no, no mean feat. 
His discovery of the Burgess Shale was like a defense attorney with absolute faith in his client, stumbling upon a room stuffed with clues that would seem to discredit him. Through his grouping of disparate body, uh, body types into existing phyla, uh, it's the shoehorning that we just talked about, and his ingenious version of the artifact hypothesis, the ancestors are elsewhere, Walcott had found an elegant way to explain all this seemingly uncooperative evidence in a Darwinian way. Unfortunately, it has failed. Uh, there were other people who went out, and we're going to talk about them in a little bit, but first he's going to introduce you to the um, Chengjing uh, fossils in China. This is chapter three now, soft bodies and hard facts. In the spring of 2000, Discovery Institute, where I do my research, sponsored a lecture at the University of Washington Geology Departments by renowned Chinese paleontologist J.Y. Chen. As a result of his role in excavating a new discovery of Cambrian era fossils in southern China, Professor Chen's standing in the scientific world was on the rise. You know more about that, those fossils than any place else. The discovery near the town of Chengjing in the Kunming, Kunming prov province revealed a trove of early Cambrian animal forms. After Time magazine mentioned the Chengjing discovery in a 1995 cover story about the Cambrian explosion, interest in the fossil surged. When he came to Seattle, Professor Chen had already published numerous scientific papers about this profusion of novel life forms and had established himself as one of the foremost experts on the fossils in this unique geological setting. Not surprisingly, Chen's visit, visit generated considerable interest among the University of Washington faculty. He came bearing intriguing photographs and samples of the oldest and most exquisitely preserved Cambrian fossils in the world from an exotic site halfway around the globe, a site, moreover, that was now widely acknowledged to surpass even the legendary Burgess Shale as the most extensive and significant Cambrian area, era locality. The fossils from the Mao Tian Shan Shale near Qingjiang had established an even greater variety of Cambrian body plans from an even older layer of Cambrian rock than those of the Burgess. And they did so with an almost photographic fidelity. The Chinese fossils also helped to establish that the Cambrian animals appeared even more explosively than previously realized. They're packed even tighter. And that's uh, Cheng himself. A uh, Chen, I'm sorry. And uh, here's uh, the, the Mo Tian Shan Shale over here. And um, the Cambrian Precambrian boundary, of course, labeled in Chinese. So there was little doubt about the significance of the discovery that Chen came to report that day. What was soon in doubt, however, was Chen's scientific orthodoxy. In his presentation, he highlighted the apparent contradiction between the Chinese fossil evidence and Darwinian orthodoxy. As a result, one professor in the audience asked Chen, almost as if in warning, if he wasn't nervous about expressing his doubts about Darwinism so freely especially given China's reputation for suppressing dissenting opinion. I remember uh, Chen's wry smile as he answered in China, he said, we can criticize Darwin, but not the government. In America, you can criticize the government, but not Darwin. <laughs> <laughs> Nevertheless, those in the audience that day soon learned that Professor Chen had good reason for questioning Darwin's picture of the history of life. As Chen explained, the Chinese fo fossils turned Darwin's tree of life upside down. They also cast doubt on a surviving version of Charles Walcott's artifact hypothesis, a crucial prop in the case for Darwinian gradu uh, gradualism. We're going to see that evidence in just a little bit. There's some more that he talks about revisiting the Burgess Shale because uh, there's more after Walcott finished. And a uh, guy by the name of Whittington, who was uh, British and was going to return all of the stuff he found to Canada for uh, to a museum instead of giving it all to the Smithsonian. 
As Whittington analyzed the Cambrian fossil at the Burgess, he realized that Walcott had grossly underestimated the morphological disparity of this group of animals. In other words, he'd been shoehorning. Many of the creatures in the assemblage featured unique body designs, unique anatomical structures, or both. Opobinia, with its five eyes, 15 distinct body segments, and a claw at the end of a long proboscis, exemplified the unique forms on display in the Burgess. But so did Hallucinogenia, Wewaxia, Nectocaris, and many other Burgess animals. And they're going to show you Nectocaris here in just a minute. You can see a kind of almost looks like an earwig. Um, that's the drawing. This is the actual fossils themselves. And you can see the eye spots and the tentacles and then a body that's not really segmented typically of a um, of an insect, but um, uh, has a kind of balletarian uh, view to it. What of the second part of Wal Walcott's proposal, the artifact hypothesis? To evaluate this hypothesis, Walcott devised a more clear-cut and less subjective test. In other words, here's what you can actually do to test it. Recall that Walcott argued that the ancestral precursors of the Cambrian animals were missing from the pre-Cambrian fossil record because of the transgression and regression of seas. He posited an interval of geologic time in which the ancestors of the Cambrian fossil were evolving offshore in a pre-Cambrian ocean and, became, and being deposited only in layers of marine sedimentary rock. In this hypothesis, only after the ancient ocean rose and covered the continent were the remains of the Cambrian sea animals preserved in the sediment that today is above sea level. So if you drill in the pre-Cambrian off the ocean, maybe you'll find this stuff. When Walcott proposed his ingenious geological scenario, it could not yet be tested. But with the development of offshore drilling technology in the 1940s, 1950s, and 1960s, oil companies began to drill through thousands of feet of marine sedimentary rock. Recall that Meyer was a uh, 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 petroleum geologist before he got involved in all this stuff. As geologists evaluated the content of these drill cores, they did not find Walcott's predicted Precambrian fossils. And then, of course, there's a discussion of plate tectonics, which means that now the uh, part of the uh, hypothesis is totally un untestable because the uh, plate tectonics sucks all the uh, sea bottom uh, down into the mm -hmm. interior of the Earth and destroys all of the evidence. There's no sea bottom older than about the, well, the Mesozoic, certainly. I think the Cretaceous is where you really start to get it. Ah, uh, oh, Jurassic. Jurassic. So it's a, the mid-Mesozoic. After the demise of the universal metamorphism idea, some paleontologists proposed simpler, more intuitively plausible versions of the artifact hypothesis. They claimed that the proposed intermediate forms leading to the Cambrian animals may have been either too small or too soft or both to have been preserved. Well, as for the idea that the ancestors of the Cambrian animals were too small to be preserved, paleontologists have known for some time that cells of filament-like shaped microorganisms, probably cyanobacteria, have been preserved in ancient Precambrian rocks. And he gives a reference there. Uh, the fossilized uh, cyanobacteria are preserved in a 3.465 billion year old bedded shirt. So, you know, you can get preservation of very small animals. Um, and as we will see, it will get stickier. Oh, I might mention here that that work of Schopp has been severely challenged. Um, the, those aren't really cyanobacteria? Um, he proposed and distributed over the world examples of the earliest life. Some of the people at Oxford looked at it, and uh, seven authors declared them to be pseudo-fossils. So... False fossils. So keep in mind that some of this is very subjective. So the, 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 the argument that Steve Meyer is using, you're suggesting, is not maybe uh, completely watertight there. Uh, but no, Steve Meyer is still right. Well, I think Steve Meyer is right because, in because, you know, because of some other findings, which we'll get to in just yeah, a little bit. There, there are excellent in other words, algae saved in uh, 
some, some around, around in Canada, in southern Canada, that are uh, close to two billion years old. And those are unquestionably organisms. Good oscillatoria, mm -hmm. spirogyra, uh, excellent uh, things preserved there, but they're microscopic. So the 3.8 uh, or whatever it is billion years may not count, but there are two billion year old stuff. So you know, even is, if you discount the other ones, you've still got those. You still have very good fossils, but very, very few of them. Yeah. Um, whereas some paleontologists argue that many animals represented, representing phyla, such as brachiopods and arthropods, could not have evolved their soft parts first and then added shells later. Since their survival depends on their ability to protect the soft parts from hostile environmental forces. In other words, what do you do with a brachiopod without a shell? Um, as paleontologist James Valentine of the University of California, Berkeley has noted, the brachiopod bow plan or body plan cannot function without a durable skeleton. Or as J.Y. Chin and his colleague uh, Wei King uh, Zhao observed, animals such as brachiopods cannot exist without a mineralized skeleton. Arthropods bear jointed appendages and likewise require a hard, organic, or mineralized outer coating. Mm -hmm. You can't have those animals without a skeleton, basically. A, a, it's an exoskeleton. The Burgess shale also, more importantly, documents entirely soft-bodied representatives of several phyla, including, and he's going to list several of them, all the way down to Lobopodia, those are soft. They don't have a skeleton, and yet they're still preserved. And the interesting thing is, in that case, the, um, uh, there's, this, this is not a complete list. If you go to the book, there's actually a few more that are down on the list somewhere else that he comments on. Any doubts about the ability of sedimentary rocks to preserve soft and small body parts were permanently laid to rest by a series of dramatic fossil finds in southern China beginning in the 1980s. Um, and this is a quote. About three o'clock in the afternoon on Sunday, July 1, a semicircular white film was discovered in a split slab and was mistakenly thought to represent the valve of an unknown crustacean. With the realization that this represented a previously unreported species, breaking of the rock in the search for additional fossils, basically trying to split it down the plane of bedding, continued apace. With the, finding of another, with the finding of another specimen, a four to five centimeter long animal with limbs preserved, <coughs> it became apparent that here was nothing less than a soft-bodied biota. This is the story of the Qingjing fossils. As a result of the very fine, small grain sediments in which they were deposited, the Qingjing fossils preserved anatomical details with a fidelity surpassing even that of the Burgess family. The Mountain Xin shale also preserved an even greater variety of small-bodied animals and anatomical parts than the Burgess shale had done. So we've got really, really good preservation, and perhaps more importantly, there's some stuff in the Precambrian that's important. The discoveries near the Chengjiang demonstrated beyond any reasonable doubt that sedimentary rocks can preserve soft-bodied fossils of great antiquity and in exquisite detail. Therefore, the soft body won't wash. Challenging the idea that the absence of Precambrian ancestors is a consequence of the fossil record's inability to re preserve soft bodied animals from that period. Upon arriving in China in 1998 for his third summer of research, Paul Qian, is a Chinese American guy, learned that Chen had discovered a fossil of an adult sponge in the late Precambrian rocks of a sedimentary formation called the Duchanto phosphorite. This is a formation that lies beneath the Mao Tian Shan Shale. As the two scientists examined the sediments that encased Chen's fossil sponge, they made a discovery that would doom the most popular remaining version of the artifact hypothesis. This is um, some of the stuff that they found in the, uh, just some of, there's a bunch more as well. And uh, these are by J.Y. Chin and Paul Chin. 
As J.Y. Chen began to examine the sedimentary rocks that enclosed his fossilized sponge, he decided to look at them in a so-called thin section under a light microscope. Chen wondered whether smaller embryonic forms of these Precambrian animals might also have been preserved in the phosphorite rocks. Sure enough, under magnification, he found little round balls that he and Paul Chen identified as sponge embryos. In 1999, at a major international conference about the Cambrian explosion held near Chenjiang, J.Y. Chen, Paul Chen, and three other colleagues presented their findings. And um, one of the, yeah, I think that um, one of the things that was interesting is that they were able to find little glass spicules in these things, which means that uh, they're actually sponges, they're not something else. Does Meyer discuss uh, their more recent findings about these uh, embryos? Uh, no, he, he doesn't. Um, uh, there was a paper last year, I think, completely discredited these. Apparently, um, the, the one thing I wish I had, uh, that he wish he had done was to actually have some photographs of the spicules in the in the uh, uh, and I'm speaking of the embryos, not the spicules. Yeah. Uh, if you had the if you had some photos of the embryos with spicules in them, that would have been uh, um, really difficult to argue against. In their 2013 book, no, notice the date. Um, this book is obviously has been updated very. Um, very recently before it was published. The Cambrian Explosion, paleontologists James Valentine and Douglas Erlin, by the way, I think that's italicized in the original and I didn't get it re-italicized when the computer stripped out all the italicization and I had to put it back in. They note that many late Precambrian de depositional environments actually provide more favorable settings for the preservation of fossils than those present in the Cambrian period. Um, as they note, a revolutionary change in the sedimentary environment from microbially stabilized sediments during the Adiacrine, uh, that is late Precambrian, to biologically churned sediments as larger, more active animals appeared, occurred during the early Cambrian. Interestingly enough, the, there doesn't seem to be all that much bio, biologically churned sediments, suggesting that uh, the animals were deposited and and sealed off from the rest of the world fairly rapidly with a whole bunch of stuff <coughs> above it. Um, uh, occurred during the early Cambrian. Thus the quality of fossil preservation in some settings may have actually declined from the Ediacaran to the Cambrian, the opposite of what has sometimes been claimed. Yet we find a rich and widespread explosion of Cambrian fauna and nothing in the Ediacaran, or at least no nothing behind. Now, um, they have done radiometric dating with zircons in this area, and I'm just going to summarize it for you. The Cambrian itself is supposed to start at about 544 million years. Um, I have an interesting graph of another paper which shows that it's gone up and down, uh, all the way up to 600 million years, for what it's worth. 530 million years is supposed to be the bottom of the Cambrian explosion. That's the beginning, of course. And the main pulse is finished by 525 million years. So if you believe radiometric dating, you're stuck with less than uh, 5 million years to get all these things to come out. 16 phyla and 30 classes originated, and including vertebrates. This is a Cambrian fish. It's a jawless fish related to lampreys. It has vertebrates in, uh, vertebrae in it. So vertebrates go all the way down to the Cambrian explosion. When I first heard why J.Y. Chin describe these discoveries in 2000, I had been investigating another unsolved question about the history of life, what caused the first living cell and the information it contains to arise, which of course turned into signature in the cell. As I heard, Dr. Chen speak that day in Seattle, my interest in another puzzling question about the history of life began to germinate. 
Could it be that the problem of animal life was in its own way just as difficult a problem as that of the origin of life itself? Though I eventually concluded uh, that the Cambrian explosion does indeed present a profound challenge to contemporary Darwinian theory, it didn't take me long to discover that some scientists believed that the mystery of the Cambrian explosion had already been resolved by the discovery of some rather enigmatic pre-Cambrian fossils. We turn to those next. And that is where the chapter ends. We're, the next chapter, we'll be talking about those supposed intermediates. Now, I will just notice that the Burgess bestiary that we talked about in five, he has references for every single one of those phyla, the original references in that note. It's a note that takes about a page and a half to get through. So this is, you know, he writes, and you can kind of understand him pretty easily, but it is thoroughly documented. Um, obviously, he worked very hard at it. Having done a similar, although not as extensive, uh, book of my own, I understand how much work it took. But anyway, um, that's uh, the end of my review for today. So uh, those of you who have comments and questions are encouraged to speak up. Uh, Ariel, and then just a minute. Uh, Ariel, and then, and then we'll give it to you. All of this is supposed to be for the uh, comma destroyed all life, isn't it? All, the, all of what we've talked about this morning is supposed to predate the comet crashing and... Uh, the comet crashing, if I remember correctly, is supposed to come at the end of the Mesozoic, the okay. end of the Cretaceous. So, yes. Uh, I think one of the more interesting points that was not emphasized here, and I presume Meyer will get after it later, but I'll mention it now. Uh, we really have more variety of body types, if that's a... Uh, it's a loose term, you know. Uh, just like the term phylum is also a loose term. But we do have more variety of animals in the fossil record than we have living now. And uh, reference is made to, you know, turning the uh, uh, evolutionary tree bottom side up. Even Gould admits the evolutionary tree is bottom side up because of that. You find you know, we, we don't have dinosaurs living now as a prime example for, for us to think about. Well, uh, as we saw um, uh, last week, even Darkwins knows that the, the uh, fossils were just planted there without any evolutionary history. Um, well, of course, he has faith that uh, there was <laughs> an actual evolutionary history. Just for some reason, it, it, it isn't documented. But in normal evolution, you would expect to start with one organism, of course, if you could ever imagine how that would happen by itself. And then you diversify more and more, and you get more and more anatomical types or phyla or whatever as you go on up. Now, we've got more diversity lower down, less at present. We have more species at present and so on, but that, that's, we're talking about basic types here. I'm talking about the main groups, which is what this discussion is all about. So uh, that's uh, another issue that where the fossil record does not support evolutionary advancement. Uh, it's more complicated lower down. All kinds of things you haven't heard about. Well, you've seen a lot of them. You go to the museum, you see a lot of these things on it's, uh, the diversity is greater, lower down. Uh, we're living in a relatively restricted biological environment. How much? You know, I'd say maybe half. I had twice as much, many different kinds in the past. So this major groups than uh, than we have now. Go ahead. So, so a creationist would say that um, all this pre. Precambrian stuff was created all at once. Uh, that, uh, like your precursor to a lamprey was there, but it died out. Uh, bony fish with plates had occurred, but they die out. God created all those at once, along with normal fish. Well, actually, a creationist would. Uh, we're referring to short-age creationists, I assume. Pardon? 
We're referring to short-age creationists, I assume. Well, yes. Yeah. Uh, a creationist would say that what you're seeing is not how they were created, but what you're seeing is how they were destroyed and fossilized. Uh, that what you're seeing is the Precambrian probably is a result of slow biologic processes. Most, not, ev not all creationists, but most creationists, I think, would say that the beginning of the, the Cambrian explosion was the first burying of uh, seafloor creatures at the beginning of the flood. Mm -hmm. That, in fact, those seafloor creatures, some of them, were not as old as some of the dinosaurs, for example, mm -hmm. that are buried in the Mesozoic. That, you know, if these creatures live for two years and these creatures live for mm -hmm. 50, 100, 300, whatever years, that, in fact, they're younger in terms of when they were born. They were living all at the same time, but the flood buried them, mm -hmm. first the bottom creatures, then shoreline creatures, then more upland creatures, uh, then finally, um, you know, uh, the creatures that lived at, at higher elevation. Um, Perhaps it wasn't strictly done by elevation. Perhaps some of it was done by um, proximity to the ocean, for example. Um, and perhaps what you're looking at also is that the smaller organisms tended to sink faster and get buried, uh, whereas the big ones tended to bloat up a little bit and not uh, get buried as fast, which explains why if you're looking at any particular kind of creature, you usually find the smallest ones at the bottom and then the medium-sized ones next and then the biggest mm -hmm. ones now. And interestingly enough, for example, the camels, the biggest ones are bigger than ones that we have now. That is, we go small, medium, large, and then the ones that we have now are medium. So that's, well, you're probably looking at that kind of uh, a sequence if you're, if you're doing it in a creationist uh, point of view. One of the things you have to be careful of is taking an evolutionary model and extrapolating it straight into creationism without re-asking all of those questions and re-modifying things. So in the, if I understood you correctly, then they were all created at once, bony fish with plates and as well as normal fish. And yeah, I think so. I think that's, that's pretty standard. Uh, well, you know, within a six-day period, and that's close enough to it once. Well, all right. The I major types. The major, the major, major kinds were created all during but creation week. When God created them, if you're doing a short-age creation, when God created them, then there were 1,656 years more or less. Um, that they were allowed to diversify, and by the time you are ready to bury them all, you have uh, different species that have, <coughs> uh, it's probably fair to call it evolved from those original created types. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, one of the reasons why you have, um, you don't have a lot of gradations, as you don't have, and particularly you don't have it between the, the higher types, First of all, between dogs and cats, there's no um, evolution. But secondly, within the cat type, you, have, you do have some evolution, but they tend to do what we have today, which is uh, you don't see a lot of hybridization between ti uh, lions and tigers, even though they can do that. And so what you see is is groups of animals that tend to go together and then breed more or less true to type, even though, uh, if you want to call it that way, breed true to subtype. Okay. Mm -hmm. so a and, and so when you destroy them all at once mm -hmm. and you bury mm -hmm. them, you don't even find that many intermediates between the species because they've kind of clumped to their own little mm -hmm. groupings. No, I understand, but I mean, if I, I but I think what I'm hearing you say is, for instance, I I read, in, I read that they found a new bony fish 
that had mostly plates all over its body, yes. but it had a jaw. And they thought mm -hmm. that was amazing because they didn't think those things had jaws for zillions of years yeah. before that. But this bony fish and the modern trout were created at the same time, but it was just another species of fish. Some were bony and some weren't. Yes. Is, is that what you're saying? Yes. Yeah. Uh, one of the suggestions that can be made is that the, the bony plated fish, mm -hmm. which there, I mean, there's, there's different kinds of bony fish. And you don't see actually the modern fish come in until I think Telios. Devonian or something like that. Mm. Or in that for the Telios. Uh, the Telios are way up in the Mesozoic. Um, that I suspect mm -hmm. that one of the things that happened was that, uh, that for example, some of these creatures didn't take well to sudden changes in salinity in the water, and so most of them just flat out died out. Uh, the ones that mm -hmm. didn't didn't quite have enough mates to keep themselves going and so they don't exist anymore and some of them probably still live in the deep ocean and we just haven't explored that much. Uh, Calicanths are a perfect example of that. Mm -hmm. You know, they're supposed to be extinct, extinct for 60 million years and then all of a sudden we found out that they inhabit the deep ocean. There may still be plesiosaurs or who knows what kind of creatures around that have somehow managed to survive um, in small pockets somewhere where people don't usually go. You hear every once in a while about stuff in the Congo that makes you wonder. Um, of course, it's a lot easier to keep them alive for 4,000 years than it is for 65 million years. Yeah. Um, but it's very possible that some of those creatures like hallucinogenia, I doubt could live anywhere other than the you know deep sea where it doesn't have too many predators and can um, uh, can live its lifestyle, mm -hmm. whatever it is, you know, just uh, managing. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, what may have happened is its its uh, environment was so totally destroyed, and so many of them were destroyed that whatever was left just simply couldn't make a living and and died out and, and we don't see them. Or there may be a few of them down at the bottom of the Marianas Trench and we just don't get there very often. <clears throat> to, to confuse the picture just a little bit, but to try to encompass reality, there is a uh, group of creationists, a very dominant group actually, who do not believe in the order in the geologic column now that they believe, like George McCready Price did, that the geologic column is not correct. So keep that in mind also in this picture. We have different views. I, would, I might comment about a question that came up earlier. Why don't we find mammals uh, down in the Cambrian? And they aren't there. Those mammals are in the Triassic. Uh, Morganocondontids are small type of mammal. You do find it there. Uh, uh, no Paleozoic mammal has been found. Uh, I'm going on the assumption that there is something to this geologic column. I'm not uh, one that supports the idea there's nothing to it. It's, it's very obvious. You, all the layers of the Grand Canyon, there are no mammals in those layers that you see in the Grand Canyon. Uh, but this is not where, according to the, the model that uh, Paul was suggesting here, that uh, the flood represented the gradual destruction as the ro waters rose of the Precambrian distribution of organisms. Uh, in that model, you would not expect any mammals any more than you, we, we don't expect to find cows in the ocean. Uh, they aren't there. They don't fit that model. They don't fit whether you're an evolutionist or they don't fit the evolutionary model. They don't fit that, that particular creation model either. Although one of the things that's kind of interesting is that the fishes have lost their evolutionary, much of their evolutionary history because we're now finding flat out fishes in the, in the very bottom layers. Whereas before it was thought, ah, this is, you know, you get invertebrates and then you get chordates and then you get vertebrates mm -hmm. and then you get, um, and then you get amphibians and reptiles and then mammals and then birds. And that was actually the best example of evolution there is. You get outside of the, you get outside of the chordates, and you don't have 
a good ex evolutionary progression. Plants, Plants don't, uh, well, uh, except for angiosperms. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to take a slightly different slant on the discussion that we're having um, and point out uh, that it is one example of a much larger kind of issue, I think, that uh, needs to be examined in more areas than just the, those of zoology and botany. Uh, in fact, it needs to be examined in a larger area than organic life on Earth. You, you can examine it equally well by looking at cosmo cosmological issues, the whole universe. Uh, and it's essentially the question of whether or not a mechanistic, materialistic explanation can account for all of the phenomena that we know in both non-living and living aspects of the universe. And what you've covered today is kind of a history of last-ditch attempts on the part of the mechanistic materialist to make that particular paradigm work and pointed out that in the face of new evidence, it, no, it doesn't seem to work. And of course, it's not just creationists who point this out. Uh, most evolutionists themselves uh, are now agreeing that there have to be post-Darwinian versions of evolution if you're going to believe in it at all at work. There are a few hardliners still, maybe Stephen Gould and Dawkins and others, that hang on to remnants of it at least. Yeah. And Actually, I, Gould has mostly let uh, go of it. Uh, right. it's, uh, Dawkins is, the, is probably the best example of the hardliners anymore. Right. But on the other hand, you have a lot of biologists. I've mentioned Tillard de Chardin before. You have Rupert Sheldrake at uh, Cambridge University with his ideas of morphogenetic organizations. Uh, at work in uh, the uh, process of nature, which come very close to what we call intelligent design, uh, but he doesn't call it God. Uh, yeah. James uh, Shapiro just recently came out with a book of evolution in the yeah. 21st century or right. something like that. But, but the other side of the equation that I wanted to mention, uh, which has been brought up here by, as intelligent design, needs to be examined as fully and as thoroughly, I think, as we're examining what's wrong with a mechanistic, materialistic approach. Uh, what forms can a purposive, uh, intelligent-oriented, uh, intelligent, uh, consciousness uh, paradigm in which we see reality as uh, James Jeans called it not so much as a great machine, but as a great thought or a great mm -hmm. idea or the work of a great mind. Uh, what forms can that take? And where are we right now in theology in terms of thinking about this question? Of course, uh, when this issue first came up, uh, Darwinism was seen, as you pointed out, as a simple model of uh, natural selection working on utterly random micro mutations to produce something that resembled what we call in ourself mathematics, intelligence, purpose, and so on. Can it produce that? Can it produce the nested hierarchies of phylogenetic structure that you find in listing things? Can it produce the nested hierarchies of recurrent cycles uh, that are mathematically predictable to five decimal places that you find in nature just by sheer chance and just by sheer randomness? Or do you have to introduce yeah. intelligence, design, purpose, something like this, not only to explain living things, but to explain the cosmos as a whole? And that gets you to the question, of course, then, of intelligent design and the designer. What do we mean by intelligent design? And what do we mean by designer? You just can't assume offhand that everybody knows what we're talking about. There are any number of hypotheses and theories out there, uh, even among theologians, uh, about this question. Yeah. One of the things we should probably do eventually, and obviously we're not going to do it today, otherwise we could spend another five hours, 
But after we get done looking at the evidence of the Precambrian, we should start and say, we should argue not to design, which is what we're doing right now, but argue from design. Once you accept design, where do you go from there? Yeah. And I think we need to recognize, too, that the uh, view in Darwin's time that we had two dichotomized alternatives here, evolution or creation, and that still hangs on today and is still debated the way it was in the Scopes trial, yeah. uh, doesn't represent where most mainstream theologians and most mainstream stream scientists are working or what's going on in their heads. Uh, we have all kinds of views that would try to put the two together in some way, divinity working through something like evolution or intelligent design working through evolution. It's no longer among mainline uh, scientists and mainline theologians a dichotomy. It's the problem of how you put them together. I have well, one comment. I think I'm going to let it go at that unless somebody really wants to say something. Uh, you do? Uh, yeah, um, Corner, Corner's uh, encyclopedia, um, the speech part of humans is hooked up to the intellectual side, whereas in monkeys and apes is hooked up to the emotional side of the brain. So we don't even have the same kind of wiring. Um, that, uh, that, of course, gets into a whole different area. Right now we're just uh, going through the Cambrian. Um, I guess. We want one closing comment here, and then I, I think I will call it a day. The geologic column looks very neat in print and takes long periods of time. We believe in a catastrophic flood in which not only water came down, but the surface of the earth was broken up from beneath. A great deal of turmoil. Why then? Aren't there a few dinosaurs mixed in at the bottom and some of the little squirrelies mixed in at the top? Whole different subject, and we'll uh, try to work on that once we get through the book. Um, I'm going to suggest that we um, call it a day for now, but uh, stay tuned for uh, next week's subject, which will be, are there really little critters that, that could be Precambrian precursors for all these Cambrian phyla. Uh, so, in chapter four, and maybe one or two more ahead, and we'll see you next week. <laughs>